So the next segment was titled um, uh, panel discussion. How did you get your child to whatever? And what we're basically going to do, I mean, the original intent was to have some of us sitting down in the front, but um, because we're kind of all over the place this afternoon, what I, what I want to do is just basically allow the people with younger kids to ask how the people with older kids, you know, how they got their kids to do things like self-feeding. I want to hear ideas and, and what you, what the parents of the older children, how you got your kids to feed themselves, how you got toileting handled and walking and all of the other things that you've done. So um, I'm going to just basically open it up into, you know, um, if I can have somebody in the room that wants to get up and say and talk about how they got their child to walk. And I, I'll start the discussion and how what we did with Chase when he was very little. We started, um, obviously, with, you know, standing and getting him to um, move around furniture and such. And then when we got his little walker, and, um, he would stand there just fine, but he didn't really care to move. So we had to find a way to make him want to. And it, for us, it was goldfish crackers. <laughs> and Dave even made him a t-shirt with, with the iron-on transfer of a little goldfish cracker that said, we'll walk for crackers. <laughs> or, we'll walk for goldfish. But you, what we did was we found an incentive, a reason for him to move. And when we did that, when we realized that he would walk, if we gave him a reason to walk, that was what took, helped us to get him to take off. And he was about three. When he went to, when he started preschool, he was three years old and he was using a walker. And he was, that's how we started. But he would walk with the walker. He actually walked into school his first day. If you go on the website, you'll see the video where he's got his walker. That was his first day of preschool. He was three years old. And um, before the end of his first year, he was walking independently. And that's how we did it, was just to give him, we had to find what would make him want to move. So um, does anybody else want to share an experience about how they got their child to do something, with the, the epiphany that helped them to realize this is how we're going to get the, through this challenge? Go ahead, use the microphone, please. Uh, one of the things for Kevin is he was always a much better follower than a leader. So if we would just go ahead and uh, act like we were going to walk out the door, for instance, he, he would follow us. And if he really wanted to be with everybody, he, that was motivation for him. Okay, good. Um, for us, uh, Annalisa was a later walker, um, but for us was the older sibling. Um, the competitiveness and taking toys away that they were hers and she didn't want to share. And um, also her peers in the preschool, she went to a really school where there's kids with special needs and kids with normal development. And that was a highly motivating thing for her when they would go to the park and the playground and other kids could move. And she wasn't able to um, go after them. So all of those little situations that she was exposed over a period of time made her have the desire. And eventually she started little by little getting up and doing little steps until she was able to walk independently. Okay, good, thanks. Rosemary? I have no microphone. Oh, well, move up to the, there you go. There Yeah, but there we go. Oh, you can keep that. So Katie's a very late walker. So for people whose child still isn't walking, I want to give you hope. She was eight when she walked. And so we had a, a little more complicated ways because her center of gravity was now higher and things like that. So one of the things to get her to stand and understand just standing and moving around is we put her in ski boots, which were really solid grounding for her, and then she could stand and sort of move around and watch TV. The other thing was her special, or her physical therapist really worked with her on muscle memory. So when you're later and you're not work, walking and you have to step it up a notch 
if competition isn't going to do it and those sorts of things. <coughs> Muscle memory is important. And she started walking on a treadmill like five minutes a day, maybe six or seven times a day for a long time. And then we also did therapeutic horseback riding. And that also got her with the moving on her, you know, understanding and being able to adjust for your moving. And so now she does walk, but she did not, like I said, she was a light walker. So people who have kids who are five, six, seven, eight, don't give up. There are ways, you know, there are possibilities there. Go ahead. Uh, what I did is, uh, piggybacking on the uh, treadmill idea, is my daughter's uh, physical therapist also put her on a treadmill. And so I went to a uh, local resale sports shop, and I walked in with Addison on my hip, and I said, I'm just looking at your treadmills. And they said, oh, well, what kind of runner are you? And I said, no, no, not for me, <laughs> for her. And they looked at me like I was crazy. But I said, show me your oldest, cheapest, slowest, most basic treadmill you have. And they had one there that was like 13 years old. It was for $100. I said, you can put it in my car, I'll take it home. And so I set that up and I put a PVC pipe with duct tape, because duct tape can fix anything for me. And I put a PVC pipe on both sides, so that was like her little rail. And I set up the TV right in front of her, because she was motivated by, motivated by baby Einsteins and the, the light on the TV. And so I set up a little chair that would go across the thing so I could sit and then I put my hands over her legs and we just watched Baby Einstein and would do, you know, hand over hand and just make her go repetition, repetition, repetition. And so that is what helped us continue that therapy from that one day a week and so then we did it every day at home. So just to encourage parents that cheap treadmills are really great. <laughs> I know that. Um, I just want to say, I, uh, several years ago, I read an article about um, a father of a child with Down syndrome, and um, how you know he was he was also a doctor or, or a therapist. I don't remember now which, but um, he, and he came up with the treadmill idea of you know and muscle memory, and if you get them on a treadmill early and get them moving, even if you have to help. The muscle memory and the, rep the repetition of that movement helps tremendously, and it also helps the brain connect, and it makes a huge difference. The younger you do it, the better, and it, it, and it goes throughout their development. It helps in, in a lot of different areas besides just walking, but walking is where it starts. Because, uh, and I believe his, his correlation was because the legs, the leg muscles are, you know, the, the strongest muscles usually. And it, once you get those going and get things, you know, get that part of the body moving, the rest of it kind of seems to follow along. And this, uh, like I said, the article was several years ago that I read it, so I don't remember all of it, but I just remember the point that, you know, how important that is for the rest of development to get them moving, so. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, uh, one of the things that helped us teaching Sarah to walk were parallel bars. My dad built <coughs> a very simple structure with just steel pipe and a couple elbows and a couple planks of wood, and we clipped her toys onto the bars, and it was a game for her. Mm -hmm. You know, they liked manipulating things and pushing them back and forth, and for hours, she would just go back and forth, holding onto the bars, pushing her toys, and she just learned that one. And it, it doesn't hurt to be stubborn parents either. <laughs> Stick at it. it. It's a pain in the butt. It's hard. But be stubborn, and your kids will surprise you on, on what they can do. You set the bar high, and they're going to do it. I will say that a lot of our kids are really smart, and they if they can figure a way out of it, they will. <laughs> if it's not fun and it's not pleasant, they know how to get out of doing it. Anybody else? Go ahead. Hi, I got my daughter Ella to, it was really hard to get her to initiate using the talker. Uh, she she has one of those um, 
apprentice something or other. It's on an iPad. I saw it go around. We have one of those. Anyway, I took photographs of her favorite TV shows, so The Wild Kratts or Blue's Clues, and just had those buttons. I'd leave it on that screen, and I'd unplug the TV so that she couldn't get to it without having to press, you know, I want Wonder Pets. She hits Wonder Pets, I plug in the TV, she gets Wonder Pets. Because that was highly motivating for her. And then once, once we got good at that, um, I also started putting her favorite snacks out of reach and saying, what, what do you want? And if it, she either has to do a good oral approximation or she has to use her talker to get the treat. And just trying to work those little things into daily life, because God knows it takes practice. Mm -hmm. And she's going to have to do it 300 times before she's going to learn it. So if anything I can do to put the things that she re this sounds so cruel. And now that I'm saying it, I'm feeling like a horrible person. <laughs> um, putting the things she wants out of reach so she has to ask for it. Um, is one thing. Also, I wanted to mention with the talker, hers is on an iPad and it has uh, a photographs. You can take pictures with it. And at first, I thought, why on earth did the school leave this on here? Because she just goes around, click, 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 taking pictures of everything. I thought she was fooling around. And then later, one day, she wanted to refer to her pediatrician. And she had taken a picture of her pediatrician. I mean, she took a picture of 600 other things. But when she decided she wanted to say something about her pediatrician, she flipped back through all those photos and pointed. So that gave her a way to refer to an event. I mean, she doesn't have, she, I don't think the pediatrician is even on the talker. But by being able to photograph that, she can then use that as, as a recording of an event that happened in time, or a person that happened in time. And that, seeing her do that made me go, oh my gosh, there's much more in here than I could have imagined. So I just want to give a thumbs up for the, uh, the assistive technology. I will say that I think um, one thing that we discovered about Chase is that he has a very good memory. Mm -hmm. um, he remembers people if he hasn't seen them for a very long time and sees them again, he gets very excited and happy and smiles and it's, you can tell that he remembers this person although he probably hasn't seen them for a couple of years. You know, that was kind of the first clue to me that they remember things, you know, even though they can't process how to get their point across to us, I think that they do retain a lot of the stuff that they learn. Go ahead, Bella. Bella always um, loved pictures, always, her whole life. In our last PICT meeting, I asked her to put in her IEP uh, for the therapist to teach her to take pictures. Because I believe this could be one way for her to communicate. And she, when we do anything we do, I, take, I, I record on my phone a video or take pictures. She loves to go home and look at what she did. Like we went to the playground. She keeps looking at the video of the playground. So I, it's in her IP and as a goal, a measurable goal, to learn to take pictures with her school iPad so she can come home and tell me what she did at school. So oh, this is one awesome. way. Another thing that I want to add is never, never, um, forget to inspire your therapists, your teachers, your, the people that work with your child to think out of the box because our children are different. They are not, so, I, and this is one, you know, one of the examples. Maybe she can communicate through pictures is one way for her to communicate. So we have to constantly think out of the box ways to do things with them. Absolutely. Go ahead. I have a couple of things I'd like to share. Um, kind of piggybacking about what you said about being stubborn. Um, Kaysen is our oldest, and we populated our church. I think there were several of us that were pregnant at the same time, so having it first, along with so many other people, 
but seeing your child different, it was very discouraging, but then it was encouraging because we have kept him with his peers um, through church, through school, especially with, um, we go to those R9 P meetings. We want him to be included in the general ed population. We want him, even if he, won't, he can't spend the whole day, he has at least, I think, 150 minutes. It's probably P, it's PE and music and then like circle time, but that's where we've had most of our success, I feel like, is because we still go to our friends' birthday parties. Of course, I have to play with him, but um, I think when he sees other peers, that's where he's done the best, is we have kept him with those kids of his age. Um, certainly we have to accommodate, but I think that that's where we've seen a lot of, of progress is um, our, we now say if we're going to do it for the other kids, we're going to do it for Ethan Kaysen too. So if, if we're going to give uh, okay, Ethan, the, my husband has those sports, and so that was kind of hard on him, but you better believe we're involved in buddy ball. We just finished up baseball, um, so, but, um, so including them and being the stubborn parent, I really feel like is we're not going to give up. And I, we do some of those kind of cruel things too, but really I think that's, that, that they are smart. If, if you can teach them and work at it, they can, they can do it. And the other thing is I'm an educator and I thank your wife, she did a great job up there. Um, because as an educator and a parent too, it's a different role whenever you're on the other side of the table. And I've, I didn't know a lot of this either, but um, we're talking about the uh, communicator devices. Well, because most of our kids have the speech problems, they have some of those goals and objectives in their IEPs. Well, if something is being done and successful at home, there is, well, in Texas, we have what's called in-home parent training, and it may be in your state too, but if there's something that's being successful at school, there is in-home parent training. So as soon as we get back, because he's a late birthday, so we had his R back in May, as soon as we come back in school, um, we're having teachers, professionals from the district coming home because he uses the GoTalk and it's actually been successful at school, but it's not at home because I don't, I don't know how to incorporate that into daily living, but there's what's called in-home parent training. Well, if, it, if it's successful at school, then they can come into the home and help you at home too. And we even have us go talk at the end of school. Um, we took it with us. We asked the school district and it, so it's ours. For, we, we take it back and forth because they said you wouldn't, you wouldn't leave your voice at school. You wouldn't leave your, so it needs to come home with them too. So those are a couple of things that we've done or that have been successful for us. Thank you. The other topic you said to um, talk a little bit about is the feeding. Uh, we, Alice is almost 14. She is too fed, but she can also eat some by mouth and she can feed herself. But it only took us about 10 years to get there. Um, we had to start from throwing up um, highly sensory um, stuff, not being able to touch things. And we had to deal with the sensory part. We did a lot of play and all that kind of stuff. Then we have to do the, all of the oral stimulation, his the gagging. Um, one thing that uh, we always did, you know, regardless of whether she would eat or not, was she would always sit with us at a dinner table. She would always be part of the routine of eating with us. Social events, she was always being integrated. So even if it just meant that she had to go in her feeding pump, uh, play with the food in a tray, she was still part of us. And um, it just took a lot of patience, a lot of dedication, a little bit at a time. And now she goes through stages where she's really a good eater. Um, sometimes she doesn't, she still relies 90% of her two feedings. Um, she's still working on the chewing and the swallowing. She's still not safe. She still has to have blended food and cut foods. But, um, you know, I mean, we never gave up. We never gave up. And we are, you know, we did it. She is feeding herself. She can eat pizza and she can eat fries and she can eat all those things that kids enjoy. And she loves eating. I think that's a really important thing. Um, We've always we always did the same thing with Chase. He ate. He sat at the table at the dinner table, and um, we never really had any serious feeding issues with him. Though he always liked to eat, but he did have times when he would, the minute we put him at the table, he would start gagging. You know, it was like okay, well, you know, and he would eat, and then sometimes he would yeah he would lose it all before he was finished, and then we would start over again. You know, 
yeah, it was just constant, constant. But it seemed to go in phases, and we were just persistent. We, he still came to the table and you know, and ate with us, and sometimes it stayed down, and sometimes it didn't. But you know, it, we, it, I think it's really important that you know the kids are always at the table at meal time with everybody else, whether they're eating or not because they need to make the association of what the whole purpose of that is all about, you know, and that's the only way they're going to do it. If you put them in a different room while you're eating, they're never going to get, you know. I wanted to um, just share. A few people have asked me how I've gotten Jillian to eat and um, have asked me about the bibs that I've been using with her. They're paint, children's paint smocks, and I get them through either Lakeshore or Childcraft. And that really made a world of difference when I was able to put the bib on the table, put the plate on the on the table, and work with her that way. And the one thing, like I'm a special educator, but I didn't know this because uh, it was my own daughter, was when I was working with teaching her to feed herself, was to feed from behind, you know, hand over hand, so that it's going in because it's not natural to go like this. So because our children are so visual, she would be watching, and I would put the spoon in her hand, and she'd go like that, because that's what she was seeing. And I had this great woman out of my house, and she's like, no, 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 you got to do it from behind. And from behind with the hand over hand, I was more successful. And so I just wanted to pass that along, um, that it may be something you want to try um, with your child. Um, but definitely encourage them, the earlier the better, because as soon as I started that and she picked up on it, I was really mad that I hadn't done that years before. So, had a question? Yeah, I think if your child has any trouble drinking, ours didn't learn how to drink until she was 11 or so, we started out with a syringe, just forcing little bits of water in her mouth so she could get the feel of of water in her mouth that never stayed. And then we went on, the thing that really made the difference, I think, is we took a honey bear bottle and stuck a straw in it that you could squeeze, and we put that in her mouth and squeeze, and eventually she learned how to suck, and within the last couple of years, finally learned how to use a straw. So that was a good way for us to, over years, get her to learn to drink. Go ahead. And starting out with a little teeny cup, small amount of liquid, so that they have success when it goes up to their mouth, like even the little to me about is just that to expect ups and downs and to expect weeks where it's progress, 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 and then you might take a step back. But the biggest thing is don't let yourself get down about that because you're for sure on a roller coaster of emotions and progress. And um, I think just like the Facebook group and stuff like that, it's wonderful to have that as support where we didn't have that when Gavin was a baby. And just for you guys to know that you will 100% have ups and downs, and that's completely normal to do. So I just wish somebody would have told us that when he was a baby. It would have made it easier. So what, I just want to share two things. One, about advocacy. When my girls were in middle school, they're very, they're one of the ones with short stature. They're, four, they're 24 years old, they're the twins, uh, and uh, they're four foot eight. So when they went to middle school, they were very tiny for their size, and middle school uh, goes through eighth grade. And some of those boys, you know, that are regular size in special ed can be big boys, and my girls were just tiny. And I was worried about their safety. They had um, metabolic bone disease, which they would get a lot of stress fractures in their legs and feet from lack of bone density, from not running around. <clears throat> and so I wanted to get them an aid, one for the two of them in the classroom. Well, the school districts don't have any money. They don't want to pay for an aid. They just think it's just fine that you just be in the classroom. And so I had approached the, at my IEP about getting an aid, and they said no. And so this was the year before, and I thought I was really frustrated and worried. This was what before they had gotten into middle school, and I was really frustrated, didn't know what to do. I was concerned for their safety. And so uh, I happened 
to talk to an old acquaintance of mine that happened to be an aide in a special ed classroom way back when they were in elementary school, years before. And she said, well, you know how to get them an aide, don't you? And I said, no. And she said, if a doctor can write a medical reason for needing an aid, they have to, now this is California, okay? I'm just gonna say this is what happened for us. They have to give you one because they don't wanna be liable at that point if they say no and a doctor has said they need it for medical reasons and they've denied it to you, they are then liable, which they hate, you know, for law, um, lawsuit reasons. So I had gone to my neurologist and my orthopedist three weeks before our next IEP, and I said, is there any medical reason you can give me why they should have an aid in their classroom with them for just the two of them? And the neurologist said, well, they are having seizures, so we could, I could say that they need to have somebody monitoring their seizures for, for safety reasons. <clears throat> so on his Loma Linda University head pediatric neurologist letterhead, <laughs> He wrote a letter saying that they had to have uh, an aid, one for each of them. Now I'll tell you, I'll give you another tip, but one for an aid for each of them. And then uh, I went to the orthopedist that they had an appointment with, and I said, "Is there any reason you can give me a medical reason why they need to have an aid in their classroom?" And I told them the the concern I had of sake of their for their safety. And he said, "Well, you know, they have this metabolic bone disease where they get stress fractures easily." And he says, if, if one of those bigger boys were to knock him down hard or whatever, they could get a stress fracture. So I'm going to say, for their safety and protection, they need to have an aid with them to keep them safe. So I, as I was walking into the IEP, one of the aides in, their, in that current classroom had already walked out of the room, and she whispered to me, they already told me they're not going to give you one. And I, I told no one about these letters that I had gotten. And I, and I walked in and I sat down and, she, and so the district person said to me, school district person said, I understand you want an aid. And I said, yes, I do. I said, in fact, our neurologist and our orthopedist feel that it's important too. And I slid the letters across the table to him. Not another word. She asked me, you know, and, and, but here's another tip. When you go into an IEP, sometimes it's helpful to have something you're willing to give up and meet him halfway on. So I told him, if I could have a really good aid, if I could pick the aid and know that it was a really good one, I would be happy with one aid for the two of them instead of one for each of them. So then I'm giving, they think I'm giving something up and I'm meeting them halfway, even though I'm really satisfied with one for the two of them. They think I've given something up and they've won something. So just something on advocacy, you know, think of something extra that you want that you, well, I'm willing to give up this if you give me this. That can also help. But if there's a medical reason you can come up with for an aid, that can help. The other thing I've shared with some of the parents, um, we were concerned uh, when my girls got too big to out the, and they outgrew their cribs that kept them safe at night and locked in, what do you do? <clears throat> some of the parents are putting the kids on the floor mattresses. That made me nervous. I had two kids. They'd get into each other's beds, and that's not a good thing. <clears throat> they would never sleep. So I happened to go, and this is in Orange County, and I'm sure another uh, uh, construction worker or, or hand, uh, what do I want to say? Woodworker, what am I carpenter, saying? Carpenter. Carpenter, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it's been a fun conference, but long. Uh, carpenter uh, couldn't make one of these, but I went into a kid's furniture store in Orange County, and they had just regular little beds, headboards, you know, with little slats in them, and they were cute white little beds, and they, the headboards were maybe 18 inches high on each end of the bed. And the gentleman who owned the store came up to me and said, what can I help you with? And I said, you know, here's my situation. I have two severely handicapped children. I need a twin size bed for them, but one with rails all the way up like a crib. I said, do you have anything like, and he goes, you know what? He goes, let me design you something. So he got out a piece of graph paper and we drew up a design and it's cute. He even did a cute job of it. And he took that little headboard that had a little, you know, curved top to it, and he just extended the slats that only went 18 inches high. He made them go as high as I wanted. I, I think I chose four feet. I think that was what I said. Four feet high and put the cute little slats on the top. And then the back is straight with the slats, the long, the long side of the back. The sides have the tall slats with the cute curve. And then the other side, <clears throat> that's away from the wall, I asked him to make it like swinging barn doors, both of them open. I don't know 
to let go of this mic, but swinging open with latches. So once they crawl in, I close the doors and I can latch them, and they're safe at night. So that's an idea, and if you want, I can try to take a picture and post it on the website so you can kind of get an idea for the design. But now they have, they've been in it, they're 24 years old, they're forfeiting, they still fit into them, and they're great. And no matter what happens, they're safe, they don't get out of their room at night, they don't wander into each other's beds at night, they don't fall down the stairs at night, and that's been the greatest blessing. So that's just an idea of a way to solve what do you do with your kids when they outgrow their cribs. So. And, and I'll expand on the story, or do you want to, Carolina? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. We uh, came in contact through um, a, a lady um, that June and Carolina know, and um, their her father, and basically their whole family builds um, furniture for special needs kids. And when we first found out about it, I know that that Anna Lisa has a bed, and that that Dwayne built. Um, we contacted him, and he built one for us, and it was the same type of bed. And he's in <coughs> Iowa. He built us the bed. He loaded it on his truck, and he drove it to Las Vegas and set it up for us. He's the most awesome man. I don't. I haven't. We send him Christmas cards every year. I haven't talked to him, but. Um, and then Chase grew out of it, and we sold it to uh, to Sarah for Carter. And now Chase has a regular uh, full-size bed. But um, yeah, there's people out there that will, you know, and I, I know a lot of people have, you know, that there were some issues about an enclosed bed, but it was a lifesaver for us because Chase was one of those kids that liked to party all night. <laughs> and I couldn't do that all night long, you know? So it, it was a lifesaver for us, and he really loved his bed. He, he, would climb in it happily and bounce all over the place, and he, he thought it was wonderful. So, yeah, there's, um, you know, if, if you, I, I know a lot of people, you know, try to get this, um, the safe sleep bed or whatever that bed is, you know, those, and, and then the, the ones that they make in, the, in Europe, we actually looked at the, um, at the, um, was it Kaiser Body bed, and it's basically, that's the same kind of style. But to get one, to buy one and have it shipped to the United States, holy cow. You know, that was like a month's salary or more, you know. So, um, you know, we were lucky that we, we found somebody to build one, and I know that there's, you know, there's probably lots more people that you could find that will build you what you need, you know. And, um, so, and, and yeah, that it was a lifesaver for us. Yeah, and in regards to that, I mean, and I still love her bed, it's like her safe spot. Um, when we do travel, um, we do have a challenge that she doesn't sleep in a regular bed, she wanders around like that. And I always have come up with an idea where we have to like, redo it and you know, it's like if you have a deep closet, you know, to take the closet out and put like a mattress in there and transform that into a bed just having to do when we cut the closet doors in half, and that becomes a way to get in and out. Mm -hmm. That it's, uh, I guess, cheaper way if you don't have the means of going all out with a bed. You know, you can improvise with something that you already have in your home. Yeah, what's going to Just to expand on that real quick, I know some of the parents didn't bring their kids because of travel situations, and there for a while we stopped going on vacations because Gavin has a safety bed, and um, at the point where he got too big for a regular pack and play, we were out of options besides him kicking and screaming all night or partying in our bed, which didn't work. Um, so we actually bought two square pack and plays, and between me and my father-in-law, we cut the sides out, one side of, out of each, I call them cubes because, you know, they're squares. And he was able to cut a board so that it could be, um, go between the two pack and plays to connect them, to keep them connected. And then he put snaps on the fabric on each side. And the, the people at the hotel where we're staying laughed at my husband because we walked in with noodles that kids play in with the pool, two pack and plays, and then two cushions that actually go in a camper that my father-in-law used to have. But these things combined makes a very long and safe pack and play for Gavin. And he, he's gotten used to it and he really does enjoy it. And that kind of got us here because otherwise we wouldn't have been able to bring him. So it's just a thought if you have that age, like he's eight, 
you know. So if you're around that age and you're thinking, what are we going to do? There's some creative stuff that you can do. Yeah, it does get challenging yeah. traveling. Did you have to put pictures of that on the something else? I did. Um, when I saw your face, I remembered, oh no, I didn't take the pictures. So oh, while we have it set up in the hotel tonight, I'm going to take pictures and then I will post it to the site. Okay, I'm going to take one more question and then we're going to have uh, the kids upstairs are getting really cranky and tired. <laughs> Can I just add something really quick with Jillian? I mean, she sleeps in a regular bed, but we used to blow up pool that we blew up in the hotels when she was younger. And that kept her safe. Can we hear a potty yeah, I wanted to get there, um, and I have to say that uh, Heather's kind of an expert on it, and I was really hoping she'd be here, but she's upstairs with the kids, so um, obviously there's a zillion more things that we could talk about. We could be, we could be here all night, and unfortunately, I'm going to answer one question. Okay, thank you. Now, just one question. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm from abroad, so uh, I have heard uh, that there are, for example, certain programs in, in certain uh, hospitals here and, and, and that, for example, some uh, intensive programs in terms of uh, feeding therapies of three weeks or four weeks, uh, intensive uh, uh, feeding ther uh, programs, same might be, for example, in a, for the purpose of physical therapy. I knew about another institution in Florida that, for example, do this uh, intensive week, weeks or two weeks or three weeks programs. Uh, so I was wondering if someone has some experience or knows about some uh, of those institutions or programs that provide this kind of a short term, uh, basically training or, or, or therapies. So in terms of both, for example, feeding uh, uh, and physical therapy and and, uh, and speeching, for example. My, my, specifically, my son is, is seven months old. It's very little. Uh, he's being fed by a uh, national gastric tube right now. Uh, we, he's starting to get some spoons, but, but not sufficiently to get him in, in, uh, to get him nutrition. So we now have to try to do some artificial standard of therapy to try to move to, to take away, basically, the, trying to take away the tube. But I heard that, for example, is, there's a program in Seattle to, on that. So if someone has some experience on those programs, that could share with you know, it would be great. Yeah, I'm just going to tell anybody if you've got any um, any programs that you're aware of or you know something in your area, because I know that you guys are looking to relocate, right? No, no, no. No, no you no, don't want to. No, but, but we can, for example, make camp to the U.S. for three weeks a day or four weeks a year or something like that is something that we could Okay, yeah, okay. Do. So if anybody's got any uh, information, please share it with him. Yeah, I, I can't say... speak to the feeding thing, but um, for physical therapy, we did do an intense program with Sarah. It's a Hungarian program. I'm a stubborn Hungarian, so that's how we found out about it. Um, so they're, they're all over the place, and Heather will get you the information afterward. But it was a very intense physical therapy. Hours every day for like a month and a half and Sarah couldn't walk on her own at the start of it and she was walking on her own at the end of the thing. Um, and and it, it's almost painful and it's exhausting but it works and it works for lots of kids. Um, and that's, that's kind of the unfortunate thing is that there's, there's really good programs all over the country yeah. but you have to find them and one of our goals is to find them for you. We want to try to set up, you know, so that we want to find where is the best program and the best the best experts, like you know, the best Hirschhorn's experts, the best epilepsy experts. We want to find those people and those programs and let you know where they are, you know, so that we're not constantly, I mean, I know it takes hours and hours and hours of searching for things on the internet to find stuff, you know, and we don't. Parents don't have that kind of time to search for that kind of stuff. So that's going to be the foundation's job. We're going to find the stuff and put it out there for you so that you know where to go to look, or at least who to call to get more information to find out you know, about programs that are available in your own area. You would think that your own um, ARC or you know, regional district um, would you know, just tell you this stuff, but they don't. They don't tell you unless you ask, and if you don't know what to ask, then you're not going to get any information. So, I really appreciate everybody coming this week, and this has been wonderful.
most awesome experience of my life, I think. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to thank a few people. Rosemary still isn't in the room, I don't think, so <laughs> unfortunately she was kind of boots on the ground and put a lot of the, uh, the child care and a lot of the other stuff together. Leslie is not in the room either. I think she's upstairs with kids, right, Troy? Yeah. She was a huge help putting together, um, you know, the, the, the pizza party last night and all of the volunteers over at the hotel for the siblings and a lot of the kids upstairs. Jessica Davis, are you in the room somewhere? She just left too. <laughs> all the people that I need to thank aren't in the room. But those are the ones that really made this happen, the local people that got all the volunteers together and got, and, and again, Dr. Butler was just a huge help getting all of this put together and you know, getting this room for us um, and getting it sponsored. And again, I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, I think the shuttle is supposed to show up at 4.30, I believe, for you, the people going back to Homewood. So you know, go up and collect your kids and uh, go wherever you're, wherever the shuttle is going to park. I don't remember where that's at. But... <laughs> what? <laughs> thank, no, you. thank you for all your work. Oh, you're, you're thank you. Excuse me, that's what I was coming up for. I wanted to thank both. Debbie and Dave for their dedication and their determination. If it wasn't for their vision, if it wasn't for their dream, if it wasn't for their um, determination to get support for themselves, for Chase, um, none of us would be here. And um, I just can't thank them enough. They really, they're awesome people. Thank you.